Now, I'm here, obviously, with Clive Bates, who, as we saw, uh, is someone who now runs his own uh, consulting organisation, Counterfactual, and has been previously a uh, director of the Action on Smoking and Health in the UK. Now, welcome, Clive. Great to chat to you. Hi, Gavin. Nice to be on board. Now, the after that, I followed that with great interest. I, I must admit to being ignorant to some of the uh, the workings of the WHO. Uh, in particular, why does the WHO allow countries with tobacco interests, the, the, you know, countries that actually make um, cigarettes, they do manufacturing, processing of, cig of cigarettes and tobacco, to be signatories to the um, FCTC? Well, ba basically, it has no choice, uh, and that's right. Uh, the the primacy in these UN type bodies is with the member states, national governments. They are sovereign entities; they can do what they like, and they can sign up to these treaties. They all, all that they have to do in signing the treaty is agree to comply with its terms. Now, there's nothing in the treaty that says that there can't be state ownership of uh, tobacco companies. So really, it's as simple as that. That's a very straightforward answer. I, those, it's great to have someone demystifying these processes and also um, showing that um, it's not as straightforward as it seems, particularly as I, we get a view from public health agencies in our own country about this. Um, how, how can we get countries to understand through this, the, the kind of multilateral work that it is, that they're mandated to work with um, public stakeholders and, and, and real people on the ground, real lived experience, and that uh, groups that are actual consumer groups, advocacy groups, are not just um, the enemy or tobacco shields or, or, or seen as some some threat to their primacy. Well, um, so I think this is, this is what I would call normal retail politics. Um, the, the, the opinions of the WHO um, should, in effect, reflect the opinions and the, uh, you know, the, the, the priorities of the, the member states, the, the parties to the Framework Convention, the, the members of the um, uh, World Health Assembly and so on. Mm. So the hard work has to be done at home. Uh, you don't wait till you're in Geneva or The Hague or wherever uh, where there's a WHO meeting on you have to basically work through the political processes in your own country. Um, now, what, what, what I think you have to do there, and, and if you don't do that, it's too late, because by the time they're off in some, you know, hermetically sealed meeting uh, in Geneva or wherever, you know, the, the member states are all grandstanding, they're all competing with each other to see who can say the most extreme things. Um, so by the, by the time you get there, it's too late. So what, what I think you need to do is build a coalition at home, in your home country, with your own politicians. And you need to talk about what the experience really is with the politicians who represent you. I mean, where we've had the most success in Europe is in connection with uh, representative politicians who are there to understand what it's like to be part of society and to reflect those views and make the right judgments. So that's what I would advise. Yeah. And given that uh, I see this a lot, in particular working uh, here in Australia, uh, where there's a real, uh, you would say, ignorance of um, some of the effects of illicit drugs, so um, alcohol and tobacco, and in particular, the the kind of demonisation of, of smoking for so long has meant that people think that nicotine is in and of itself a dangerous uh, drug. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that there's um, real value in um, educating not only um, through you know some of the work that we talked about before through advocates, but um, through films and other kind of novel ways to uh, inform our politicians and others. So I think there's a You Don't Know Nicotine film. Um, there's a few mm. other handy pieces of work. Do you think that's a worthwhile strategy? So, so look, I mean, if people believe the wrong things about these products, uh, they believe that nicotine's about, you know, approximately half... Uh, of, of people, I mean, it varies from country to country, but let's take the United States. Approximately half of people think that, um, you know, uh, most most of the ill effects uh, and cancer caused by smoking is down to the nicotine. Now, if you, if you have a strategy based on the idea that people smoke for the nicotine but die from the tar, and, you know, basically half of the public doesn't understand that and you need to include in that half of the media half of the medical profession and everyone then it's not going to work 
So perceptions and understanding risk are absolutely foundational to the tobacco harm reduction idea. If you don't think it's less harmful, then what's the point of switching to it? If you're a doctor, what's the point of recommending it? And if you're a policymaker, what's the point of having proportionate regulation? So yes, the question is what works in doing that education? And the film is great. I haven't seen the film and I hear it's pretty good. Um, the film is great, but people have to see it. So, so the question is, how do you get under the skin of the way people form their perceptions? Um, you know, what do you do? Is it just one, a, 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 one scientist at one point on a prime TV slot saying, this is how it is? And then everyone goes, ah, now I'm thinking differently about this. Or do you need to saturate the place with social media? Or not? It all depends what works. And this is something which I, I, I see a lot of our... Uh, colleagues who work not not just across uh, harm reduction in tobacco, but harm reduction across um, alcohol and other drugs, um, face this same challenge. And so that's uh, that's something which is is completely uh, yes, it, it's a very strong point in that you have to do what works in your situation and harks back to some of the earlier presentations. Now, how does the FCTC fund uh, like funding impact on its the way it develops these policies? Um, well, um, so FC, FCTC is funded primarily by contributions from the uh, parties to the convention. I mean, not a lot of people understand this. So the, the convention, uh, the FCT secretariat and all the machinery of the convention is funded separately from WHO. So when, when the United States decides to cut its funding from um, WHO, it makes no difference to the FCTC. It may make a difference to the tobacco-free initiative within the WHO, but it doesn't make a difference to the FCTC. Um, WHO itself, however, is funded by the most Byzantine uh, sort of labyrinth of, um, uh, of, of voluntary contributions um, from pharmaceutical companies, from uh, activist organizations like Bloomberg, uh, and Gates, uh, it's funded by bits of add-on from member states, you know. And the problem is all of that money comes with strings. So Bloomberg is deeply involved in publishing the WHO uh, on the global tobacco epidemic. Not surprisingly, the analysis reflects Bloomberg's uh, prior assumptions about what is good and what's bad. And what he likes is his own policy prescriptions, the Empower framework, if you know what that is. And what he doesn't like is tobacco harm reduction, and therefore WHO marches in line with uh, with uh, with his opinions because he's a significant funder. Yeah. Now, we we talked a little. We touched on this earlier around what's important and what's not, and in terms of um, focusing on the effectiveness of getting your message across. Now, do you think that? Um, a lot of smokers and, and in fact, people who, who vape wouldn't really know about the FCTC and, and kind of the yeah. its funding and activities. Do you think it's important to shine a light on that, or do you think uh, it's something which is in fact a sideline, or, or it's it's not the primary target as we talked about earlier? You know, is it something that is is yeah. worthwhile putting a light on? Right. So, so I think this is a really important question. Okay. What 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 should somebody who's worried about this do? Is is at the heart of this. So. Um, so, so my my approach to this is that, firstly, all, all the really big decisions and wins are made um, in your country, well well before you get to to WHO. WHO is what it is, and it's a reflection of the attitudes of the countries in the Conference of Parties and its member states. So, you really should be working to change the views of the parties and making sure they take the right positions in to the meetings. Now, kind of ordinary, uh, sort of ordinary vapors. You can't. It's not fair, and it's not reasonable to expect them to do a lot. So, my my advice is, if you're in that position, is to join one of the consumer organisations. And what you can do is put some put put your weight behind them, even put a bit of money behind them, and they will be the people who are across the sort of expert discussion on your behalf, and they will be able to guide you. On how to having how to have an impact, when to write that letter, when to contact your member of parliament, when to respond to a scientific travesty of which we have, uh, you know, many and often, um, and that's the way to go about this. 
can't expect somebody who's just busy just getting on with their life and being a normal vapor to get into the intricacies of WHO, which are very, very bizarre anyway. But let other people do that work for you, but allow them to build up. Put your weight behind them, put a bit of money into them, and that's the way to go about it. And they'll help you have an effect. Now, I'll just give a shout out to those people bringing in uh, questions and comments. Now, we do have some great questions, and I know that you want to cover some of the approaches of different countries in the um, in the region. We will have an expert panel a little bit later in the program, which will cover a lot of that. Um, so particularly around the moves in Australia, um, some of the changes in New Zealand, as we talked about with the consumer advocates before, India and uh, Thailand. So th there are a range of things that we will talk about more in the expert panel. But just as a last question and briefly, uh, this is something which I've wanted to know for some time, Clive. How do they select the delegates to represent countries at the FCTC? Is it, you know, do they just pull it out of a hat? Or is it, or is it straight from their public health networks? Or what, how do they do that? Look, it's a, it's a mixture, okay? So sometimes, sometimes there will be, um, depending on where it is as well. So if, if the FCT meetings are, uh, FCTC meetings are held in Geneva, um, the, a country will have a permanent representation at the UN uh, in in Geneva, and they'll send along uh, the health attaché if they have one, or just a representative. And they will they will take instructions from their capital. So, if, say the Philippines, they'll take they'll get instructions from Manila. And if they if they want to intervene in the meeting, that person will deliver the intervention, feedback information to the capital, and essentially it'll work that way. Other countries, larger larger delegations or people with a bigger stake in this. They may send somebody from their health department, their public health officials. Sometimes they have an official who's devoted, devoted to international public health. So someone like the UK, for example, or France will have somebody who deals with public health at an international level. Depends on the size of the government and the specialization of the officials involved. So it's a, there isn't one particular story. Sometimes you see huge delegations as well, um, partly, partly because there's a lot of interest in it. But I'm afraid, cynically, partly because there's a lot of interest in foreign travel, staying in four-star hotels and travelling business class. Um, and that's a regressible part of this type of uh, convention meetings. Yes, well, for those of us with not much money, that, that's been cut out, quite frankly. So that's something which in this post-COVID world, we are on the internet. And look at this, a perfect example of um, advocacy over the web. So uh, thank you very much, Clive. It's been certainly informative. Mm -hmm. We will join you i'll be there with you and another range of experts on the expert panel later in the program so thank you very much for your time and we'll head to our next segment